Thank you. Hey, hey. I'm, uh, we're getting really excited about Grandparents Day, so uh, it's not too late. It's the, coming up this Friday. If you want to register your grandparents, please go to swoo.edu forward slash grandparents day and sign them up. Um, they'll get a free t-shirt, lunch, uh, ticket to your good man, Charlie Brown. Um, also, if you haven't seen that yet, come and see it this weekend. Uh, but grandparents day is going to be great. Please sign your grandparents up and uh, hope to have a good crowd. Thanks. Hey guys, so I thought I'd come up here and do some kind of like accent for St. Patrick's Day, but I figured that embarrass myself, so I'll embarrass myself by wearing this hat. Um, I, <laughs> I just want to advertise our drink of the month, which is our Irish cream latte and our um, the shamrock. And so just come out and try it at Blue Hill. Thanks, guys. There are four welcome mat chapels this week, and one of them is Thursday night at 7.30. Uh, as we're talking about our response to people in the world, we'll be talking about our response to refugees. And at 7.30 in Nicholson Mitchell, in the upper level of the old fellowship hall, we will gather together, and there we'll have Matt, um, excuse me, Ben and Heather McEwen, who have been missionaries to Vienna and working with refugees who've been passing through Europe. Uh, they are home and then will be returning this summer, so we will hear their story and have an opportunity to pray for them before they return to Vienna. And then also Wes Pate, who is Ellen Pate's uh, husband, will be joining us. He just spent a few, about uh, 10 days in Greece helping to rescue Syrian refugees who are coming across uh, and into Greece and on into Europe. So uh, join us for this casual chapel, interview chapel uh, at 7.30 in Nicholson Mitchell on Thursday evening. Thank you. Well, good morning, Swoots. Good to see you this morning. Great weekend, great start to the day. We remind you that uh, tomorrow is service day. And so uh, we will be fanning out all over this county and other counties and places around the upstate doing service and community service for people. I remind you that you will get chapel credit for that. So when you participate, make sure that you sign in with the person that's leading your group. Those will be turned back in to us and then you will receive chapel credit for that. So uh, what a wonderful opportunity to be the body of Christ uh, out in our community in a very tangible way. As we continue talking about uh, putting out the welcome mat about the issues of this day and how the scripture speaks to them and how we can take those things and then become people who welcome others, those that are marginalized, those that have no voice, those that are in prison, those that have no power. Those are the people that God called us to minister to and we get the opportunity to hear and then to go and to do those things. Again, the welcome mats welcome you in and as you leave, the welcome mats are turned around to welcome you to take this message out to the world and to those that God died for and sent his son to die for. So uh, we're very, very happy about having this opportunity. We have a chapel on Friday, so uh, we want you to come back. That's preview day and also grandparents day. So it'll be a great gathering as we come in here and as we join for, uh, together for that. So make sure uh, that you put that on your calendar. It's there. It's been there all semester, but it's an unusual to have it on Friday, but we're having one on Friday. Today, our guest speaker is Jeremy Summers. Uh, you'll love him. He's a man that's been on our campus many times. He's the director of spiritual formation for the Wesleyan Church, and he's coming to speak to us today, and uh, then he'll be here tomorrow for, uh, as we host uh, part of a conference, a teleconference, uh, that is going on with the Wesleyan Church and with other churches. So it's a great opportunity that we have today to worship, to hear, and then to do what God leads us to do. Pray with me. Father, we thank you that you have called us and that you chose us. And Lord, like the prodigal son, we sometimes have wandered far off, but when we turn around, Lord, you close the distance. You run to meet us. You don't even let the words get out of our mouth because you know our hearts and you accept us. Lord, build in us today, change in us by your spirit, our attitude that we may be those kinds of people for others. Allow us, oh Lord, 
to love with the love of Christ, to indeed put the welcome mat out for all. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and join our voices together as we sing and worship the Lord.
Good morning. Happy uh, to mathematicians out there. Happy, happy uh, Pi Day. It's 314. I'm not a mathematician. I'm more of a March Madness. So those are the March Madness people. Hopefully your brackets are uh, completed. I'm uh, from Indiana. Uh, wow. I got one fellow Hoosier over there. And uh, how many here are North Carolina fans? Any, any Duke? Clemson? Or Clemson, are they even in it? I meant basketball. I mean, you guys got it in football, so, which is good. It's a good way to start, isn't it? But my name's Jeremy Summers, and um, I live in Indianapolis. And <laughs> I'm just going to keep saying that. And I have four kids. My life's crazy. It's hectic sometimes. But it's one of the most exciting parts of my life is spending time with, with my kids. Uh, I have 
two girls, two boys. Macy's 11. Ava, we turn in nine soon. Micah will be seven. I'm trying to figure out how old are these kids. It's like, number one, how old are you? And I got Ty, he'll be five. And when I look at these kids, I'm reminded of the power, the power of family, the power that God has given us as his children, the power of what it means to love others, the responsibility that we have, whether we are a parent or we are seeking of what it means to be part of the family of God. And when I look at my kids, I'm reminded also that God, thankfully, is in control. Because there's times that goes by where I'm like, am I doing the right thing as a parent? It's tough. It's hard. It's also fun. Wouldn't trade it for the world. And when I look at my kids, I'm reminded of the beauty that God has created everyone to be in his image that everyone is an individual, and yet as a community, we are called to help shape each other. And yet we live in a world that is very isolated, very much about the individual, right? And that's not how God created us to be. He did create us as individuals, but not to be in isolation. And family is a great representation, understanding of what it means to be really the body of Jesus Christ. Because in a family, those are the people that you love the most, but sometimes you also hate the most, right? It's okay to do an amen on one of those. It's all reality, we get it. The people that we cry with, that, that know us best, and yet, sometimes we want to distance ourselves from, and then the next day we want to embrace. The ones we shout out and brings almost the worst out of us, but also helps shape the best parts of us, too. Does that make sense? And so, this idea of family, and you shape that into who we are as Christ followers, and I look at the state of the, of the United States, the church in North America, and I wonder what has happened to us as Christians in North America. As a whole, not necessarily you, maybe not your church, but in the landscape, the church in North America. Do you ever ask yourself that question? Do you ever look at TV or maybe in your neighborhood and you think, that's not me? but that's the label that's been put on you? Are you tracking with me? Do you look at that and say, this is not my family. This is not a good representation of my family. That's not who we are. And yet the world cries out for something more and what we have isn't necessarily seen because that's not what they're seeing is what we're saying. You see, there's a separation between what I say, the mind and the heart, because I really believe that seeing is believing. Seeing is believing. There's a lot of rhetoric, a lot of chatter from the mouths of those that are followers or say that they're followers, but their actions don't represent the action and ways of Jesus Christ. And God has called us, as his children, to raise up and to encounter the places that don't have a voice, but also to redeem the places that his voice has not been in yet. Our Father, who art in heaven, will be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. On earth as it is in heaven do we believe as is in heaven will come to this earth 
to redeem, to reconcile, to bring wholeness. That people are invited to the family, to the table, to be a part of something much more than what is. Because our Father, who art in heaven, is actually with us here and now. Do we believe that? Or is it just something we say? You see, the way to the soul is through the heart. Many profess to believe in God, but act from a disbelief. Many believe Jesus died for their sins, but do not have a working, active belief in God here and now. So a fundamental question I want to ask is, is life possible before we die? Is life actually possible? The life of the kingdom of God actually possible before we die? Is it possible to live life now, to experience life in depth and density? Not life after death, but actually life before death. You see, the current church, as I've said, is just a reflection of what we believe is possible. And unfortunately, we have churches full of people who profess all kinds of stuff they don't believe. They think that by professing it, they're doing actually something good. But in the area of holiness, this idea of not just the inward, but also the outward, we cannot be right on the inside and not actually do it living it out. But of course we have people who pretend that they can, and that simply isn't true. And what we're experiencing right now, I believe, in many of our communities, is a byproduct of actually doing this well. So the illusion, the deception, is the idea that you can be all right on the inside and not act it out, and professing is supposedly enough. The information does not transform you without it actually going into the heart, into action. Dallas Willard makes this amazing statement that familiarity has bred unfamiliarity. In other words, we are so familiar with the concept of this idea of living out our faith that has become unfamiliar. We know seeing people come to know Jesus is important, yet we rarely see people come to know Jesus. In John 15, Jesus tells us who we are and tells us who he is. I don't know about you, but I'm not the type of person that necessarily likes to be put in, in place. Does that make sense? So here Jesus is telling us, this is who you are. Whether you like it or not, this is you. This, everyone, this is you. But let me tell you who I am. And if you want to follow me, this is what has to happen. So he tells his disciples, followers, and I'm assuming many of you are followers of Jesus. He says in John 15, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Now remain in me. And I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. And neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, Jesus says, and you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will do much. He goes on to say in verse 9, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I've told you this so that my joy, my joy, says Jesus, may be in you, and that your joy may now be complete. So my command is this. This is my command. If you're a follower, this is what I ask, to love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything. Get this, everything 
that my Father has made known to me, I have made known to you. The very power, the very love, the very interaction that I have shown you, my Father has now given to you if you remain in me. My daughter, daughter Ava will be nine next month. She's about three years old, and we went to the sprinkler park. Okay, I don't know if you have these around here. Um, I'm sure you do, right? Um, I just remember as a kid, you just set up the hose thing outside, you jump through it. And that was my, my day, right? And now they have all these, like, gadgets and things. I'm like, what in the world? It's crazy. But as a parent, I love it. I'm like, yes, free babysitting. I can sit and watch my kids play and all that stuff. You know, it's kind of Lord of the Flies sometimes, depending on how many kids show up, okay? So you realize sometimes parenting has its own uh, evangelistic tools sometimes. But we're going to this park, and all these spring, there's all these pipes and buckets and all these things happening. It's pretty amazing. And the cool thing, it's free. So I take my daughter Ava there, and she's playing. And she's at a distance, probably from me to the back of this room. And I'm sitting on, the, on this bench and just reading and doing some stuff and watching my, my daughter play. And there's this big, tall post that goes up maybe 20 feet. And there's this massive bucket, probably about the size of these two speakers put together. And it fills up with water. And as it fills up, it starts to tilt. And as it gets to the very top, it spills all this water to the ground. It's pretty cool. So you have kids running through it. And as it falls down the ground, they run through it. Well, Ava looks at this, and I'm watching her, and I'm like, oh, man, she doesn't understand what this thing's going to do. She's three years old, right? But I'm also someone who's curious. Now, I know she's not going to die, so I want to watch and see what happens. (laughs) No one knows she's my daughter, all right? We're far enough where they probably think their parent must be close. I can see. Just part of growing up, right? Suck it up and move on. So here she is standing underneath this bucket. And it's filling up, and I'm like, oh, man, it's going to hit her. And I know I'm grinning a little bit, you know. It's not mean. I'm just, you might see what happens. And so it fills up. And as it's filling up, it starts to tilt. And I wish I had my iPhone with me because I wanted to record it, right? But I didn't. You know, that's my thought, right? Record this, and you can post it and all that stuff. It'd be kind of cool. And then law enforcement shows up in my house. <laughs> but it fills up, and as it tilts... It starts to pour. She just looks up, and all this water just nails her in the face. And she hits the ground, and I'm about to move, and I'm like, wait, let's see what happens. So I'm watching, and no one else sees it, so I'm like, okay, I'm okay with everyone else. And she gets up, and I thought for sure she was going to start crying. So I'm getting ready to comfort her. Yeah, I'm going to comfort her after that, right? Yeah, daddy's been watching this whole time. It's okay. Trust me when you're 16, right? So here it is, it's dumping on her. She gets up, and she's looking around, and she has this big grin on her face. I'm like, what? I'm like, you go, girl, that's right. Get back up. So she gets up, and she looks, and here it goes again. She does this like three or four times, and she's just loving it. And I'm loving it. I'm like, man, this is pretty cool. And then the fifth time happens. And you know how God sometimes works in mysterious ways? You're like, I have no idea why this is happening, but it's happening. All of a sudden, I started to get emotional. And as she stands, she looks up, and she sticks her arms out, out wide, as wide as she can. She looks up. And the fifth time it hits her face, she just looks up and lets it just drench her, knocking her out. And she gets back up the sixth time with her arms, and she's just bringing it in. And it hit me in that moment that many times we run away from those places And God says, if you remain in me, I will remain in you. And that image of Ava getting knocked over, I'm imagining that's what Jesus is saying to us when he said, when we remain in me, everything that my Father has made known to me, I've made known to you, and everything that I can do, I will do, if you remain in me, and it will knock you over, you will love it, you will experience it, and guess what? Continue. And this is what we see with the grace of God working in us. As we look up and his spirit falls upon us, there is no other place we'd rather be than in him. 
and this idea of remaining, when you look at the science involved in it, when you look at the branches, sometimes we think in faith that it's me taking from Jesus, right? We talk about that, right? We need to pray, we need to worship, we need to read the word, we need to go out and save people. And Jesus is actually saying to us through this image, and when you look at the science of how fruit actually gets its nutrients, what Jesus is saying, if you remain in me, I will push myself into you. You see, it's not the fruit that takes from the vine. It's the vine that actually gives to the fruit. And so it's us remaining in the place to receive. But then there's also the turning point where God says, now go and do. It's not enough just to stay, but now we have to produce the fruit, right? The fruit that will last. And I believe we have a lot of people that look flowery, that smell good, but in the end, there is no fruit in their life. You see, in John 15, Jesus tells us that love one another as I have loved you. And he's not necessarily telling us that I loved you, like, oh, you're the best in the world, you know, you're going to be famous one day, and you're going to pronounce my name and do a lot of worship songs, and you're going to preach the gospel of thousands of people. You see, it's not that type of love that he's telling us. He's saying, as I have loved you, those that I've welcomed into my family, I want you too now to go and love others as I have loved you. Remember when you weren't remaining in me? Remember where you were? Now go and love others as I have loved you. You see, the transformation of the world is at its heart the transformation of personal relationship. And there's so much grief around us today. Just let me throw out these words, and you just, you can feel it, okay? You can feel the grief. There's grief around us. And I'm not going to get in depth with it. But you have the power through the Holy Spirit, if you remain in him, to go and love others as Jesus has loved you. Do you believe it? Do you believe that he has the power actually to work through you? Or is it just rhetoric? You see, these words that the world is feeling grief on, especially in North America, race. Is there a grief in there right now? Yes. Gender, is there a grief there right now? Yes. You could probably go on and on, just saying one word that people can feel grief. Something happening inside of them, that they're longing for this love, this acceptance, this understanding that Jesus has come and invited them into their family, into the family of Jesus Christ, but yet our rhetoric sometimes pushes people away versus inviting them into a space to receive the love of Jesus Christ, that they can also remain to understand what it is to be poured of the Holy Spirit and able to experience transformation here and now on this earth as it is in heaven. You go on, you see that salvation of the soul is not just about where you go when we die. The word salvation means a healing or deliverance. And at the deepest level, who we are and care that God, through the presence of Jesus Christ, we understand that though you have not seen him, talking about Jesus, you still love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with this glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your soul. And so, the question again is, can you experience a life now? Can you experience life before death? And the answer is, of course, yes. But then how do we get there? You see, the mission of God 
tells us that therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. You see, this idea of transformation of the heart, of seeing is believing, is this understanding. If you leave here with anything, these two words, is that we are called not just to understand what Jesus said, but to do also what Jesus did. I truly believe that the ways of Jesus are the best ways. Jesus' ways, what Jesus said and how to live, are the best ways if we truly understand the Gospels. But it's not just what Jesus said, but also how he did it. I think sometimes the world will accept and believe through how we do things rather than just what we say. Does that make sense? We have enough of people saying things, but not actually doing what they're saying. And you have the responsibility to transform the places that you're in first before you go somewhere else to change someone. What makes you think that going somewhere is going to be different than where you're at now? You see, God has called us to go. And when we go, we realize that we are people that are sent. And when we understand that concept of being sent, we realize that where we remain is where exactly where God wants us to go. So it's not waiting to go somewhere, but rather living out what you already believe or you say you believe here and now. You see, a revolution, transformation doesn't happen later. It happens immediate, now. So it's not just what Jesus said, but it's also how he did it. And so these two things I want you to keep an eye on here is the character to be like him as well as the competency to do like him. My son Micah, amazing boy, brilliant, brilliant boy. He's about six years old. He's going to be an engineer probably. He's one of those kids that speaks his mind and doesn't realize what he's saying. He's just speaking the truth. So much so that sometimes it gets us in trouble. Um, we were on an elevator, and uh, there's a lady, probably in her 90s, and she had um, some extra makeup on. Let's put it that way. Um, very nice lady, right? One of you're just looking at her, you're talking to her, you're like, oh, you definitely, as an adult, you, you can bite your tongue probably better than kids do. Maybe some of you are like, nope, I'm still like that. The thing is, in my mind, I'm thinking, I walk in, I'm like, wow, that's a lot of makeup. It's the first thing that hit my, my mind. Of course, I didn't say it, right? And we're talking, the lady's nice. How are you doing? Oh, good, oh, good, nice, ma'am. Yeah, cool. Yep, good. Yeah, this is my son, Micah. And Micah's just staring at her. I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> he's locked. He's locked. And, and that's his thing. He, and he's not, he's not a mean kid. He's just observant, right? He's just observing. He's not saying, man, what is wrong with you? Or anything like that. But he looks at her. He's like, what's on your face? I'm like, no. You know, it's like, you know it's coming. You're like, ah. It's obvious, though. So instead of him inside, I'm like, yeah, what is on your face? But he said it, and so we're exchanging, you know, and she's like, oh, she's really nice. Oh, you know, it's just, you know, I'm just having makeup on. And I'm like, yeah, Micah, it's makeup. You know, mommy wears makeup. And he's like, no, not that kind. And I'm like, dude, just be quiet. I'm like, this is going nowhere. So I tried to change the subject quickly. But he's a great kid. Fun to be with. Great heart. Just loves people. Very tender heart. And this past summer, it was time for him to ride a bike. And he has to understand something before he can do it. So it's like you have to pedal, right? But there's some things you just have to do to get it. I can explain read through something, go through the mechanics, but you just have to do it to understand it. See the difference? It's not enough just to know. You actually have to do it to understand it. 
And this is the way Christianity is. It's not just enough to know information. Sometimes you do it, and then you realize this is what it's about. Well, here we are riding this bike, or Mike is riding this bike. I'm, I'm like getting frustrated, like really frustrated, okay? I mean, I don't remember how I rode a bike. I just did it, right? At least that's what I thought. And so I'm holding the back of the, the bike seat, and Mike is getting on this, on this bike, and he's starting to pedal, but he's pedaling with one foot. I'm like, dude, you got to pedal with both feet, you know? How are you going to? So I'm trying to teach him. I'm getting frustrated. I'm holding the back of this thing, and we're going, and he falls over, and get back up, man. Come on, let's go, and trying to be that coach, right? You kind of remember in high school, you know, this coach, come on, get back up, boy. Come on, you can do it. And he's like, leave me alone. I don't want to. He's like, this isn't fun. I'm like, it'll be fun later. Get on. I'm like, of course it's not fun. You're pedaling with one foot. How fun's that? You're just going to be like this dog chasing a tail. And so pulling the back of this bike, and he's going. And literally, I spent weeks and weeks with him. I was just getting so tired. I told my wife, I'm like, does he have to ride a bike? I mean, I don't even ride a bike anymore, right? I mean, they're motorized now, right? Let's buy something that takes you there. I'm like, it doesn't make sense. Yes, he has to ride a bike. I'm like, all right, so we're doing this. And finally... He's starting to get it, starting to get it. And when I let go of the back of the seat, he takes off, and he's starting to pedal. Left, right, 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 left. And then he stops, and he's coasting now. Now he realizes that I let go of the back of the seat, and he looks back at me, and he has this big grin on his face. And I smile back at him, and then it hit me. Keep looking forward. What are you doing? Right? He's just so in the moment, like, I've done it. I'm doing it. And I imagine this is what Jesus means when he talks about our character and competency of being like him and doing like him. Being like him and doing like him. It's like riding a bike. We've got to be like him, do like him, be like him, do like him, be like him, do like him. Character, competency, character, competency, character, competency. That we have to be like him, but then we have to do it. And sometimes we do it before we truly understand what we're doing. The why behind it. The knowledge behind it. And when we actually become like him, when you ride a bike and the momentum takes you, it takes less, less effort, doesn't it? And for many of us, it's the beginning of putting the effort in place to start moving where God wants us to move and understanding that as we are being like him, we also need to do the things that Jesus did. And so our relationship, as Jesus shows us in John 15, is that we've made the gospel hard and easy to live out. But the gospel is actually easy, but difficult to live out. See, we have churches and people, a society that is hearing the message and thinking, no, that's not what I want. If this is what you really think, then how come this isn't happening. Where are you? Where are your actions? And God is calling us to remain in a place to receive his power, his grace, his love, so that we just don't consume, but that we now are able to go and to bear fruit that will last from generation to generation to generation to generation. Welcoming people into the family. And this relationship is one that people enter into the brokenness. As we enter into the brokenness of this world, we look for a response individually. People coming into relationship with him. But we also enter into the world systematically. That we come and cry out for those of the systems of injustice. As followers of Jesus, you have the responsibility, yes, to know about Jesus. You can know a lot of things, but knowledge is not going to transform you. But it's through the heart 
that you're able to find Jesus active and moving. The question is, do people around you see what you believe? Do people see actually what you believe? My daughter Ava, we were sitting around the dinner, dinner table as a family, something that we try to do often, it's a practice, we try to do at least three, four times a week. As my kids get older, it's more difficult, so I've had to stay pretty consistent with it. Even if it's everyone rush to the table and we are able to eat for 20, 30 minutes, that's fine. But with music and, and sports now, with my work schedule, my wife's work schedule, it's crazy. But the dinner table is a place where we can meet together and actually see each other, right? And talk life, hear what's happening. And not too long ago, it was a pretty busy season in my work schedule. I was traveling a lot. I had a lot of writing deadlines. And I got home from work, and I'm sitting at the table, rush in, sit down, and my mind was not there. Does that make sense? My mind was not present. And you know how it is. You can show the, the nonverbal skills of, so people can say, oh, yeah, they're, they're here, right? They're here. When really you're not there. You're just sitting physically in front of them. And so here I am sitting, and we're chatting around, and I'm just kind of shaking my head and, you know, eating. But I'm thinking, oh, man, I got this to do, I got this to do. I really don't want to be here right now. And those are the thoughts going through my head. And Ava was talking to me, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. And I'm just shaking my head, yeah, yeah, uh-huh. Well, this is what I did, okay, uh-huh. Well, what do you think? I'm like, yeah. And she's always asking questions. Can I do this? Can I do that? Can I do this? Can I do that? Can I do this? Can I do that? And I'm like, dude, just do whatever you want, you know. Go find that sprinkler thing. Go play, you know. No, but it's good. She, she, Daddy, can I? And I'm like, yeah, okay, yeah. And I'm eating. And I'm just thinking, I have this deadline I got to meet tonight. I just can't, I, you know, how can I get out of this conversation quickly and move on? It wasn't good parenting skills at all. But it was a reality. And all of a sudden, I feel these two little hands go on my cheeks. And turning him to her eyes, she said, Daddy, listen to me with your eyes. Listen to me with your eyes. My first reaction was, who taught you that? And I realized it was me. There's times where she wasn't listening. I'm like, Ava, listen to me with your eyes. You see, I believe God is telling many of us in today's culture, guys, do you see what I see? Listen to me with your eyes. Do you see that I'm present here and now around you? That I've come to redeem, to make things whole again? You say, but do you believe? Do you see what I see, all the chaos and the confusion, I am here. Will you remain with me? And will you love others as I have loved you? You see, we have the ability as sent people wherever you go as sent people to go and to proclaim but we also have been called to go and to remain it's not enough just to know what Jesus said it's also just as important to do what Jesus did and to realize that he's doing it over and over and over. So the question for us is, do you see? Do you see? Because for the world in which we live in, seeing is believing. And we are called to go and to be. 
Let me pray for you. Your Father God, you have called us into your family as followers of Jesus. You have given us the abilities, the power to go into places to redeem, to reconcile. You have given us the ability to go and to listen, to love. And as some of us have given your name a bad name, we believe that you still have the abilities to transform not just lives but also communities. And you have called us to go into places that others might not go into. And you have called us into places where we frequent often. And so as your followers, Jesus, I pray that every person in this room understands what it means to remain, but also to go and to proclaim. Lord, may we understand the combination of what it means to understand your word, but also to do your word what it means to live out in action this transformational love that our world is truly crying out for, God. God, may we see what you see. And may we listen to you with our eyes that you are a God that loves us. But you also love them. So as your followers, Jesus, I pray, I pray that your kingdom come on this earth as it is in heaven. May we be a part of this movement. May we be part of the action. May we be part of what you are doing in the here and now. And may we not only just proclaim it, but may we also do it. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and your Holy Spirit. Amen. Dismissed.